15. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, oh, where's the, there we go. Oh no, there we go. Now, I got into this uh, field of raising money for cancer research and was astonished in the process of it, I'll explain how I got into it, to discover that every year, does, there is no precise figure for this, but let's say a safe figure, is every year dozens of potential new therapies for cancer are thrown out. These are not quack medications. They're seriously researched. They are drugs and interventions that have been developed by respectable scientists in leading cancer labs around the world and have shown great promise only great promise, but have shown great promise in preclinical studies. They're drugs that could ease the suffering and prolong thousands of lives. And I'm focusing on cancer medication here, but it does apply to many other medications. There is just this constant level of research that does not get developed, does not get tested in humans, even though it shows very promising preclinical work. But they've all been ditched before they can be tested. And why are they discarded? Principal reason, and what you could say the summarizing reason, is that because the researchers have run out of money. How much money? By and large, it's less than it costs to buy this watch. This is the story of one of these drugs, and my friend Dido, and a proposal I have for how we can possibly release some more money to get these neglected medications out of the trash can and back, into pre back through the preclinical stage into clinical trials. That's my friend Dido. I'm not a medic or a biotech person. I actually know very little about medicine. I trained as a physicist, but now I'm a, a biographer and an illustrator. But Dido was my best friend. We worked together, I was, she and I, I was, her boyfriend for about 12 years, and after we split up, we continued to get along extremely well and continued to work together. We worked on each other's books together, we worked on each other's manuscripts, and we had this relationship that was just vital for everything we did. And then in 2007, she was diagnosed with pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer. It's the same cancer that Steve Jobs had, which is not ordinary pancreatic cancer. It has a, a very different biology and it has a different prognosis. If surgery doesn't work for this cancer, then the standard therapies will give you about five to seven years. Dido was diagnosed in 2007. It came back in 2009. It was all over her liver. It was all through her blood. And she started on chemotherapy. I decided at the start I was not going to interfere, I, not that anyone would have listened to me, but I was not going to complain about the standard therapies that were being offered for this disease, even though everyone knew they didn't really work and they, in many cases, display a kind of act of desperation on the part of the doctors who are doing their best, but these are the best things that are on offer. So I started searching the web, like everyone does in this sort of business, and these are many of the medications you come across, and if any of you have done that, you'll know. It takes a long time not just to read about all these things, but to figure out a way in which you can judge which is the quack stuff and which has potential. Most of those are quacks. It took me a year and a half, but at the end of that year and a half, I did discover something. I was watching a YouTube video about Canadian pigs, and uh, I saw at the back, behind where I would be sitting, and I'm standing at the moment, the equivalent in this YouTube video, saw at the back of the video a poster. And I froze the frame of the, the YouTube video, and I enlarged the poster, and I saw an address, and there was a telephone number, and I rang this telephone number because this was an address for a company that had worked on something called an oncolytic virus, a virus that, for, to put it in short form, specifically targets cancer cells. I mean, for medics amongst here, I apologize for that brutal summary. But in this case, what appealed to me, and that's the way I thought about this virus, was that it specifically targeted neuroendocrine cells. So I rang up the number, and nobody answered. 
The company had gone bust three years before. But it put me on the right track. I then understood the sort of stuff I needed to be looking for. I went to the medical literature. I looked through the immunotherapy journals. This was a type of immunotherapy and found another institute that was also working on this stuff. And I rang up those people. They were in Uppsala, in Sweden. And I rang up the lead professor, a man called Magnus Essend, and he's the first hero. In fact, the major hero of the story. He and Justina, his Justina Ledger, who worked with him, they, it was her papers I read, so they're both the great heroes of the story. He picked up the phone. I asked him, why are you not developing this medication? I have someone who needs it. She wants to go on the trial. Why are you not having a trial? And he said, well, we've run out of money. And I said, how much money? And he said, now, admittedly, that is rather an expensive watch. <laughs> what he actually said was $2 million. So I flew out to meet him. There he is, sitting in the middle. There's Dr. Ledger, Professor Oberg. Just to give you an indication, Professor Oberg is the head, or was at that time the head of the Society for the Study of this Type of Cancer in the whole of Europe. This was not a quack medication. And I got shown around the lab, and I spoke to all these people, and I said, if I can get you that money, that money that's less than the price of that watch, will you put my friend Dido on the trial? And he said, yes. So I flew back to England. I decided I needed a quick way to raise this cash. I wasn't going to do bring and buy sales. I don't do marathons. <laughs> so instead, I wrote a piece for the Telegraph and got a nice little slot in there and also got through a route to the Financial Times. And um, there was a piece came out in the Financial Times plus an editorial and somehow got the story under Radio 4 as well. That was all in this Sunday. And then I waited. I didn't have anything else. That was it. That was my shot. And uh, Monday went by and Tuesday went by. Two Sundays later, I got a reply. It was from a journalist. He wasn't rich. He had the disease. And he said, if I had the million pounds, or the two million dollars, I'd give it to you, but I don't have it. So I rang him up and I said, well, let's form a campaign group and let's see what we can do. And here's our first meeting. We had our first meeting in the Weatherspoons pub, <laughs> Victoria Station. <laughs> and uh, that's me, that's Dominic there. He was the journalist. Um, Colin, a friend of mine, uh, he's involved in books, knows nothing about medicine. Uh, Maya, she knows, she did know about neuroendocrine cancer. Liz, as far as I know, knows nothing about medicine. But she is a superb crowdfunder. Eight months later, we gave Magnus his money. I wrote another piece for the Telegraph about that, celebrating our triumph. It came out on the day Dido died. I didn't want, after that, to have anything to do with drugs. I didn't want to have anything to do with Uppsala. I didn't want to hear anyone mention the word neuroendocrine. I didn't want to have anything to do with Dido. And then about a year later, Mosaic rang me and encouraged me to write an article about why our campaign had been so successful. And I hadn't really thought about it properly before this. But then I realized it came down to two things. One was the crowdfunding. That woman, Liz, who runs a company called Fieldcraft Studios. If any of you need a crowdfunding campaign, go to her. We still hold the record for the most money ever raised through crowdfunding for a clinical trial. I think in the end, now, because it's continued to bring money in, it's something like $700,000. But the second thing was unique. There are other people doing the crowdfunding, not as well as she does it, but there are other people doing it. The second thing was unique. From the start, we realized we need someone rich. That was the only way we were going to do this fast. And the best thing of all would be to find someone who was rich, who had the disease and had a personal interest. And the best thing beyond that was that he would do the same thing that I had got done for Daidu. He would say, you can have the money, but you put me on the trial. There had to be a real personal interest. And effectively, that's what we'd done. We'd gone out hunting for a rich person, saying, if you've got the disease, we think we can get you a place on this trial. And we found him, Vince Hamilton. He's the second hero. The third, I think, we're on now. 
Vince, um, tech, uh, oil man from America, not Texas, Arizona, living in Geneva, where in fact that watch is made. <laughs> and um, he was fascinated. He wanted to give the money. He said he'd give whatever was necessary beyond the amount already raised. And he wondered why all rich people didn't do this. He said, if you could find me 10 of these, I would invest in all 10 on the condition that once they come to trial, once these neglected medications come to trial, I can go on the trial. This had never been done before. It's important to stress what's happening here. In general, there are two types of funding in medical research. There's altruism on the one side, funding from charities, funding from governments, and there's on the other side investment, venture capitalist funding. What we were doing was proposing a third way. The rich person invests, but not for a financial return which is perfectly acceptable. Financial return, no one minds about. That's called capitalism. You invest, you get money back. You hope to get more money back than you put in. All we were saying was, adjust that slightly. The rich person invests not for money, but for another shot at health. That bothers some ethicists. They don't mind greed, but they don't want health. <laughs> it's not many ethicists. It's got to be fair, but, but a number. And you get some... Startling reactions for people. What, we're not doing something more to help the rich, you know. I call this, and I wrote the piece that I wrote for the Mosaic, the plutocratic proposal. And it's my proposed solution. I should say, there is one other case in which this has happened. I've, it's never happened in cancer before, and no, no serious illnesses, but I spoke to a professor in Texas. He doesn't want me to tell you who he is. Because he says, you know, we do get money in this way from another sort of person, rather old men. The old men in Texas, they do this, they, um, they marry these very young women. And then they come to us, they're very rich, these men, they come to us and they say, um, would you run a trial in impotence and put me on it? And that's the only other case I've heard of where you get finance in return for a trial place. Here's how... That's... Our, um, that was our, our fundraising organization when we got the money in. Here's how it would work in a textbook case. What you would have is you'd have a coordinating organization. That's the dating agency. I call it the dating agency. But you can call it what you like. The idea of the dating agency is that it marries up a rich person with a disease who's looking for treatment. Now, this is not alternative treatment. This is additional treatment. They go to this organization with money saying, look, I've just been diagnosed with this disease. I would like to have something available to me when the traditional treatments fail, as I know they will, as they always do in cancer. Well, not always, but frequently do in cancer. And I want you, the dating agency, the coordinating body, who has a database complete with a, a full list of all the neglected medications that are not being developed in my type of cancer. I want you to invest in that. And that's the last contact the rich person has with the research organization. In fact, they don't even have contact at that point. They, everything goes through this coordinating organization. After that, it's simple. They go back, they have all their traditional therapies, they wait until those traditional therapies no longer work, provided things balance out fairly well. At the end of two or three years, the clinical trials have begun for the neglected medication, and they get a place on it. So it's a fair, straightforward exchange. They give the money through a central organization which invests in neglected therapy. Now, there are all sorts of possible details that need to be sorted out, but the uh, medical ethics group at Oxford were sufficiently interested in this to ask us to write a paper for the Journal of Medical Ethics about it, because it hasn't been done before. Critical to it all is this coordinating body in the middle, the dating agency. What's in it is an ethics committee, a legal group, a, um, something that reaches out to uh, look for research, look for neglected research and find rich patients, and this database. And the importance of that, from the ethical point of view, is that it means that the rich person is never in direct contact with the researchers in the neglected area. 
in the area of neglected medication. So there's never any chance that the rich person is bullying the researcher, demanding things be done in a certain way. They simply provide the money. It is simply a way of raising money, and then everything proceeds just as it does with an ordinary... Oh, that's telling me to stop. <laughs> just, which I will very shortly that it proceeds after, after you've gone through the dating agency, everything proceeds absolutely straightforwardly. The dating agency acts as a buffer to deal with the possible ethical complications of what is essentially a very simple system that is set up and works perfectly well and is the foundation of capitalism as long as it involves greed. All I'm saying is that there's another way to raise money for medical research if we shift from greed to giving people another shot at health. <laughs>